Okay. So let's ask our panelists to join us. Neil, John, can you turn your cameras on and join? And uh, the audience is welcome to ask the panelists questions as we go. And Andy, can you pop up the chat Please. screen so folks know how to do that? And let's just kick it off and start with, uh, with Neil. Neil, question for you. Um, you're a distributor and a consultant. So when you sit down with somebody to talk about chillers um, and, and they say, oh, yeah, no, don't talk to me about that, what do you tell them that's new and different and um, maybe more attractive? What are the changes? What should they be looking at and looking for? Oh, Neil, you're, you're muted. Um, you're right. I am not muted anymore. Uh, since our focus today is on is on waste heat recovery, I'll, I'll leave out the centrifugal chillers and, and, and things of that ilk and, and talk about uh, absorption technologies a little bit. Um, we now know, you know, ammonia technologies now go much colder than, than they used to, and, and now we can deploy uh, heat pump technologies um, where we're actually upping the grade of, of the waste heat. Um, on the absorption, straight up absorption side, using lithium bromide in water, we're now using triple effect as well as double effect and single effect absorbers, and I think Thermax will, will go into that a little bit a little bit later. Uh, and then we've got some emerging technologies, um, especially in the uh, <coughs> excuse me, the binary fluid ejector side, where we're doing something completely unique and, and different, um, and creating a thermal compressor as opposed to a mechanical compressor. So we've got all, all kinds of exciting things. I mean, the, the, the takeaway is it's not your father's absorber anymore. Uh, the control technologies now prevent uh, the disasters of the past. Um, anybody who's got an absorber now knows they got to be really careful or they freeze up and cause all kinds of trouble. Uh, by and large, that, that's done now. You, you don't worry so much about that anymore. So uh, advances in control technologies are really important to, to look for and to, to apply. Great, thanks. So John, um, Tipping it over to you, um, you are the energy efficiency consultant for Northwest Food Processors, and I'm, I'm putting up a slide that refers to the uh, initiative to reduce energy intensity by 50% in, in 20 years. Um, you were part of that. Can you talk about what, what the end game is there, what, what you're up to, and why? You, you got started five years ago. What, why and, and, um, and how's it going? Well, yeah, so, so in 2009, the Members Association set the goal to reduce energy intensity 25% in 10 years and 50% in 20 years. And really, it's all about being competitive, Skip. It's about getting, you know, getting people competitive, reducing their costs, treating energy as a manageable cost. And, and, and when we say 50% in 20 years, that's really more of an aspirational goal. Uh, but that's something that, you know, through innovation, technology, and uh, and new resources, that's really, that's kind of that, that aspirational goal. Right, so here's, here's your slide that talks about what vectors are going to achieve that goal. I'm gonna blow this up so folks can see it better, but um, it looks to me like 50% of the goal is, can be achieved, or you're planning to achieve it with efficient equipment, upgrades, things like that. Many other things that can be done, but so I guess one of the questions I have for you today is how big a deal is waste heat recovery towards this overall goal of, of um, energy intensity reduction? Well, it's a very big deal. I mean, if we think about our, our electrical use, our single biggest use of electricity is refrigeration and chilling. So if we can, if we can reduce that, that's going to make a big impact on electrical. And then on, on thermal use, actually, as an industry, about three times the amount of energy is used in thermal processes. So um, if we can recapture that, use that waste heat, recycle it, and you know, put it to beneficial use, that's going to reduce our thermal use and reduce our electrical and refrigeration. So, I mean, this is one of those technologies where there's an opportunity to win coming and going and going back again, um, it, it, it sounds like. Is that an overstatement? No, it's not an overstatement. And, and again, for us to achieve that 20-year goal, it's going to be about innovation and new technology. So I'm very excited to hear and share this with, uh, with the folks on the line about these new technologies. Well, great. Speaking about the folks on the line, let's take a look at, at who they are. Here's an interesting um, um, data from the registrants. Uh, it says that almost 60% of the folks um, watching are already using an absorption chiller. Now, um, does that sound like, does that number sound accurate to you? Well, actually, that's kind of a surprise, a head-scratcher to me. The, 
you know, I, I haven't seen too many chillers out in industrial use, so certainly in, in more commercial commercial use, yes, but in a food plant, I haven't seen many out there. So I'm concluding that that means that we have the advanced placement class um, assembled um, for this session, and um, the folks that are watching are folks that are already, you know, their minds around this. I was going to say attenuated. That's too big a word. Um, level of urgency, though. Um, Almost 70% of the audience says, yeah, we got, we got to do something soon. And 20% of the audience says, we have to do something right now. It's urgent. Um, that's interesting. Who's attending from different functional areas? Everybody's attending. That's really exciting um, that it's not just the specialists. It's the entire organization um, signed up to watch. And I know that um, in some cases, we've got companies with four, five, seven, or eight um, individuals watching. And they're going to get together after the show and compare notes. Uh, well represented with um, the hierarchy as well, so decision makers are on the line. And let's um, let's give some attention to, I don't know, maybe I'm management, so I can say this. Maybe some of the managers on the line need the primer version of what are these things. Um, so Neil, let me throw that to you. What what are these things, absorption chillers, and how can a layperson think about them? Well, ge generally they're they're thermal compressors as opposed to mechanical compressors. So a, a typical chiller, you, you need an enormous quantity of electricity to, to run the mechanical compressor, uh, to run the refrigeration cycle, and, and make your chilled water or other fluid. Uh, so in the case of absorption chillers or, or the, the binary fluid ejector, um, you're using thermal energy. So you can use waste heat. You can use the results of a different process uh, and recover your money, right? So. You're using something you already paid for to, to get a second product that, that you can use to uh, further your process and improve your efficiency. Great. And then uh, I know that the uh, presenters will be talking about these terms. Can you give us a once over and John and Neil just, uh, you know, let me throw this to John. What, what are single effect, double effect? Um, what, what does this mean? Well, actually, I was going to defer that to Neil. I think he's got Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Neil. Sorry. Easy enough. Single effect, think of as, as once through, one, one use of the waste heat. Uh, so you can use a lower grade waste heat, like, you know, 200 degree water or low pressure steam, like, like 15 PSI steam, uh, and you generate uh, rather inefficiently some chilled water from your, from your waste heat. But because it's waste heat, it, it seems to be okay. Uh, a double effect machine, you'll get twice the amount of usable energy out of the same input but you must use a, a higher quality input, uh, higher temperature, higher pressure. Uh, in triple effect, you get almost you know, two and a half or maybe more times uh, the usable output of a single effect machine. And again, you have to use higher quality input heat to, to affect that. And low-grade low heat is typically the, the stuff you, you throw away, right? So it's your steam condensated at 200 degrees, or it's low-pressure steam coming off, you know, five pound steam coming off some processor or cooker or something that's using 100 pound or 200 pound or higher steam to, to affect the process. So basically right. it's stuff you used to throw away. So, so John, am I right that uh, lots of the food processors do have a lot of low grade heat? Um, lots of BTUs contained in big, big volumes of water, for example. Um, so that is one of the holy grail pursuits is how do I recover that and turn it into something? Oh, absolutely. I, I said there's lots of waste. There's lots of heat being used in the industry, and a lot of you know waste heat that's left over after after the first use. Okay, so um, let's take another look at at who's in the audience uh, or what their interests are. So uh, we asked the question, what are the sources of heat that you're trying to recover? And it's 80 percent water, right? Some really really hot, and some not so hot, as we just said. And what do you want to do with that? Now again, this is a select. It's a self-selecting group in the audience. But it's really interesting that half of the audience wants to chill that heat. So, so Neil, your, your position as a consultant to industry, if somebody says, here's my plant, look it over, and they got a bunch of heat, what's your first recommendation? Well, you know, you've got to take into account what it costs to, to install these technologies as well. So the first recommendation is, simple as possible, use heat for heat, right? And the mm -hmm. second recommendation is maybe use the heat to improve the quality of the heat, right, and, and use it, and then use the heat to produce chilled water, or with some of the technologies you'll hear about, simultaneously produce chilled water and upgraded hot water. 
Okay, so it'll be interesting to see, hear what our presenters have to say about how they can deliver chilling um, and do it economically. Uh, that's really the whole point. We're here and there are some interesting new things to see. Um, here for the panel and for the uh, presenters, these are the question areas that the uh, audience wants us to give attention to. Um, obviously, um, how do I reuse heat? What's the cost effectiveness? And then um, talk about the methodologies and the relevance to me of these new um, methodologies. So we will ask the presenters to you know, talk about applications, not just talk about theory. Um, and then, so this, Neil, this is for you because you, you told me that, that it all nets down to it's the same as real estate, location, location, except for making sense of these things. It's does it does it work economically? Um, so, um, any any thoughts before we move along to uh, the first presenter on the cost-effective issues and and how what are you looking for for it to pencil out? Well, you, you, you've got to look at your your input cost versus your output product. In this case, chilled water or, or enhanced heat, and then your your capital cost to install it. And, and your real estate cost, right? Some some of these technologies uh, require far more space than, than others. So so you you've got your your installation costs, your your implications on your plant space and your real estate, and then your input costs. If it's waste heat at zero, sometimes it's not zero. You 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 know you need to use gas or, or something, um, but it all needs to be taken into account. Get a life cycle cost and uh, see if it reduces your uh, production cost. And I'd say location, location, location is important. You want that uh, central plant where you've got both your heat source and your refrigeration all in one spot, and often those are, you know, there's not a lot of spare, spare space left over there. And like the, closer, the closer you get to that, the lower your capital cost to install it's going to be. So. Right.